seeing there, some folks suggested to you that you might want to take the temperature of uh, the rest of the legislative body that you serve with, um, maybe before determining some of those more significant steps. Um, and I think that is the summary of what I heard as uh, folks' uh, desires and advice and possible suggestions for this committee to proceed. Thank you. Senator Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in response to that, I think that um, we've done a good job in remembering that we're not here to um, make judgments on this thing. We're here to gather facts, and we're here to uh, get as much information as possible. And I think when Mr. Moore came in today, he demonstrated the value of that interaction. I mean, the questions that were asked in this committee were excellent, and they caused many of us to have further questions. I think I do think it's important that Cynthia Montgomery and Aaron Chadman be here, and I don't think they will be uh, unless we subpoena them. Um, and I think again, as part of the part of the information collecting process, um, there's nothing more important, as far as I'm concerned, is that that I draw part of my job to get all the information possible and share it with the public. And as a result of that, Mr. Chairman, I would make a motion that we issue subpoenas to Cynthia Montgomery and Aaron Chapo. I second that. There's been a motion by Senator Diamond, seconded by, by Representative Strachio to uh, issue subpoenas to Cynthia Montgomery and Aaron Chapo. Discussion? Representative Strachio. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Does that um, suppose the reason that only those two people right now is that um, we anticipate that Commissioner Ms. Jordan will be here. Um, and the only reason that he wasn't here today and just submitted the answers, uh, some written testimony is that he was ill and that we anticipate that he'll be here the next week. All I can say about that is I, I did speak with the acting commissioner uh, 10 days or so ago. And he told me he wanted to be here. He just was medically unable to be here. President McCollum. Sure. We had this discussion kind of months ago. I think we started to talk about this again. In fact, you said this is a bigger deal than just what we all see on TV. So, is there anything we need to know about doing subpoenas from this committee? Um, you saying it's pretty complicated. Well, on, only in that there is another piece of statute that comes into play once this committee issues subpoenas. It's a very old statute called the Legislative Investigating Committee Statute. Um, and so by virtue of issuing the subpoenas, which you have the authority to do under OPEGA's statute already, it dovetails then into that old statute. And there are procedures that are laid out and rights of the witnesses and whatnot that occur when, when we start that process. So it would just be a matter of us doing what we've done before, which was getting clear about what those procedures are um, and what the rules around that statute is. Ideally, someday, somebody will take that statute and meld it together with our statute and you'll have some very clear guidance. Uh, but we've done it a couple times before, so it's not like we don't know what we're doing, but it does require some thoughtfulness. Just to, just to, just about then what I'm hearing you say it's more like an education for us as to how it works as opposed to a different company. Yeah. As I understand it, if we decided to we did wish to get issues of things, that's all we would need to vote on today. And with, with regard to that, if you wanted to address the subject of the investigatory committee, we could do that at the beginning of our next meeting. We chose to do that. Right. Yeah, well, we, you would have to already be in that procedure uh, when those folks come and decide. You know, so we would, I would work with the chairs to make sure, maybe, to make sure we were all clear about what that, um, those procedures were. Thank you. Uh, other discussion with respect to the motion, starting with Representative Sanderson and Representative Thank you. Um, the issuance of subpoenas for the two individuals Senator Diamond stated, and I mean, I, not being familiar with the, with how the committee goes through the, the subpoena process, number one, before I vote to issue any subpoena to anybody, 
I want a clear um, delineation of what that process is. Um, secondly, um, I think there were a lot of questions brought up today where um, I'm not sure if I can support just that motion, the motion at all, or maybe that motion amended it. Amended. Um, I would like to perhaps maybe take a break for a caucus to discuss that off mic prior to um, agreeing to any vote. We have never held cards and caucuses in this community before. People want to get together, we can. I think that's a vote. Unfortunately, you know, this committee is made up. I, I don't we believe I said a corner caucus each other, but just a, maybe a discussion off mic um, with the chairs, both of them. We'll take a five minute recess here. No, we, we can't, we, that's why we can't do it. Okay. Me, All right. We, we do it. So we're going to conduct our business here. Okay. Um, I, um, I'm not going to call for the public caucus because this committee was set up specifically with six Democrats and six Republicans for a reason. And we become like other legislative committees, we will have lost, I think, something. We um, so I don't know if I can answer the first part of Representative sure. Sanderson's question about what the process is sure. in terms of the issue subpoenas. Um, a subpoena letter uh, is drafted from, from the committee chairs. Um, it is sent to the individuals that have been asked to appear in the subpoena, telling them the date, time, et cetera, um, that we've asked them to come. Uh, we get a response back from them. So far, we've had no one refuse to come uh, that has been subpoenaed. But there is the question of what would happen if they refuse. There's a process laid out um, in the investigating committee statute that then I think allows this committee to take additional act court action or something like that. Uh, we haven't had to go down that road. But the people come. Um, the committee um, chair will put them under oath if that's something that the committee decides that it wants to do. That would be another decision point, whether or not to uh, question them under oath. Um, they are under this investigating committee statute. They are allowed to have um, an attorney uh, be present with them uh, while they're being questioned. Um, there are some decisions <coughs> made about whether or not um, there is the degree to which it is a public uh, proceeding in terms of being reported and sent out over the airwaves. We've always uh, proceeded fully with the full public process that we have now in terms of it being on mic and it, you know, press being allowed in the room and whatever, but the, the witnesses under the investigating committee statute do have some rights um, to, uh, to weigh in on that. Uh, but other than that, it's a question and answer session and um, then the committee gathers the information that it has and we talk about, again, about what you want to do with the information that now uh, sometimes a PEGA will create a summary of, the, um, of what's been gathered under uh, testimony, and other times it's pretty clear on its face, and we don't need to go to that extra um, She also raised a question for me, though. There is a cast of, depending on what this committee still feels it wants to pursue for information, there is a group of people beyond uh, Ms. Montgomery and Mr. Chadbourne that would be relevant to the couple of places that Opega has outlined in its brief that we're still unclear on. We haven't asked those people other than the commissioner to come real voluntarily yet. Um, and sometimes in the past is what this committee has done is say, we'd also like to ask XYZ to be here voluntarily. If they say that they're not coming voluntarily, the committee takes it, you know, at this time you would take a vote to say, hey, if they're not going to come voluntarily, we also want to issue subpoenas to them so that you can get everybody here at the same time. So I just wanted to alert you to the fact that if what you're after is to try to see if there's any way to um, <coughs> toss out 
places that were still a little gray, that there are some other individuals, I think. Thank you. Representative Sanders, has that answered your questions with respect to the process? Yes. Representative Kemp. Thank you. Um, it was valuable to have one of the and some other members um, that left the room. Um, and I understand we can't do that. But, um, well, Representative, excuse me, but I, I, I didn't say that. What I said was we're not going to start the tradition of no, 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 just amongst ourselves. But um, I'm thinking that, um, trying to think of the additional information, I think Opaque has done a good job um, and very thorough. I wonder how much more information we get out of these two individuals. Um, uh, but having Mr. Moore here was uh, great clarity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Representative Stark here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess um, I agree with um, Ms. Ashcroft about what we, we kind of narrowed it down. There are a bunch of other people, but not maybe you know, a group that we might like Rich Abramson, like Sarah Vanderwood. I mean, there are people that might bring some clarity to exactly, you know, especially in light of the letter that was sent by Cynthia Montgomery, in my view, misinterpreting what the report actually said. So um, I guess I would be in favor of requesting other people to come and then giving that ability to then subpoena them because I don't want this to just continue like another month and then we wait. I mean, we need to know who's going to come next month and try to get wrap up at least some portion of this investigation because um, it just is going to go on too long. So we kind of know who the players are and I'm sure that you have a list because I have a little list. The only people that I want to invite in this time that I think it would have been nice for her to just come up and say, well, this one said this, what did you say? I mean, that was kind of helpful to even have Commissioner Disjardin's letter, I mean, his, his stuff, and then just say, well, this is what he said, did that happen? So I'm for, you know, submitting a subpoena for the two who refused to come already. Commissioner Disjardin, um, he said he wanted to come, he'll come the next time if he says he's not coming, or anybody else that we want to see that isn't coming that would be able to issue a subpoena so that they can be Thank you, Senator. Um, the public, certainly in their testimony today, really wanted to go, wanted us to go farther than our charge, but at a dead minimum, they want us to not be stonewalled. So I think Momentum will probably build to at least compel the testimony that we need to be able to find the facts that we were charged upon. Uh, that is at least a minimum expectation I think the public gave us. And I think we also demonstrated the insufficiency of putting questions in writing and having them answered because what we got from the acting commissioner was sort of fanciful after the fact justification that didn't actually relate to the timeline. Uh, so we really need the ability to have questions and answers in person so that we can flesh out what we're being told. I think that's the process the public just asked us to do. Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And and I guess I'd like to add that I think uh, what we have for a motion at the moment is appropriate. Um, I think that we should be identifying the other people we'd like to have here, but consistent with our past practices, we should be uh, not uh, immediately issuing the subpoenas. We should be inviting them. Uh, I think just for expediency, it would be wise to do as Director Ashcroft suggested that if they do not agree to come willingly that we, um, in our vote, authorize the chairs to come to them so that we can have their presence at the meeting. But I think they are you know, all due um, respect to being asked uh, to appear on, on their own vote. Yes, Senator Burns. Thank you, Senator I guess I come at this from a different perspective. What I'm hearing from the proponents of the uh, subpoena, uh, I'm not sure that anything new is going to be coming out of these folks. I, I, first, firstly, I, I, I don't, uh, I disagree that these folks don't have a legitimate reason for not coming. Uh, just because they are not named as litigants doesn't mean that they don't have uh, information that could be extracted here, if you will, that may possibly be detrimental to whatever they're facing in the uh, federal. 
So I understand that. So I really uh, want to put my uh, administration in that jeopardy either. But as far as what information, new information is going to be gleaned out of uh, those folks coming in, uh, or maybe the other ones that we're talking about not subpoenaing but writing, I don't think you're going to learn anything new. I think you're going to learn some interesting things. Uh, but that's not what we're here for. There's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of angst about this whole thing. Uh, I feel there's a lot of people that want to culminate what they feel has been uh, uh, several years of mismanagement, if you will, uh, the White House and, and the uh, office. That may or may not be true, I don't know. But I know that certainly was the tenor of what I've heard this morning. I understand that. And I guess I would admit that I have some of the same anxieties, even though I'm in the same party. I don't like the way some things have been done. But you know, I wasn't elected to govern. And those individual acts have to rise and fall on their own merits. I don't think we can, uh, in good conscience, try to pull everything together and see whether or not there's enough weight to break the camel's back. I think they all have their own merits, their own issues. We are here right now, we have agreed to stick to a specific set of circumstances up until now, anyway. And that's what transpired with the goodwill equally situation. And frankly, that's why I asked the question this morning of uh, Mr. Moore. As far as I'm concerned, had it been better judgment on both, maybe all three parties, Size. This all could have been avoided. You can't convince me, and this is a work session, Senator, but you can't convince me that that board that was going through that process didn't realize the dangers, the pitfalls that they were getting into. If they read the papers, if they listen to the news, they pay attention to what's going on in the legislature and the state government, they knew what was going on. That was the first pitfall that they entered into. What the administration did or didn't do is probably not what I would have done, and probably not what most of the people around this hospital would have done. I don't know. I wasn't in that circumstance. But we seem to know what it is that took place. Was that illegal? I haven't seen any evidence yet to show it was illegal. Was it something I would have done? No, sir. Yes. I wouldn't have done it that way. Again, I'm not the governor. Now, had I been uh, asked as a legislator or a group of legislators, what do you think about this particular uh, situation here? And the funding set up that was uh, previously set up for this school and where this school had come from and where it was going, I would have given a different opinion than other people than apparently uh, uh, was given to that uh, uh, board that made the decision. I would have said, this is a no-win situation, because I know what the history is. I have respect for both of the people and the way they do business on some, on, on, I, I guess I would say on most situations. Uh, these are two extremely prominent people in the state of Maine. And I think that they conduct themselves differently. They have different goals. But I've worked with both of them. I've seen that both of them accomplish some good things. And I've seen that both of them do some things that I wouldn't do. Everybody on that board knew some of this stuff. And they went ahead and it anyway. And then that caused a set of reactions. We got the governor involved, the commissioner involved, the board involved again, and now we're involved. Bad scene for the state of Maine. It's a bad scene for goodwill weekly. But I haven't seen where anything has been done that requires requires this legislature going forward. I wish I could uh, make myself behave. I wish I could make other people behave the way uh, I think government should work. But I don't have that ability. As far as others are concerned, I'm only 
able to do what I think is right. I frank, frankly don't want to work a lot of things that I've seen in the either in the state or the federal government. But I can't change those things. But there are venues that can. I don't think this is the proper venue uh, to try to undo that series of mistakes that were made. And I'm not going to pursue <coughs> or support pursuing something that I think is going to uh, cause more grief, more bad will for the state, more bad will for goodwill Hinckley, and produce no viable, reasonable results. So because of that, Mr. Chair and, and Co-Chair, I'm not going to support this. Thank you, Senator. Chairman Kruger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And all due respect to my friend Senator Burns, I believe that we are on very solid ground per the Constitution and per statute. We've had a uh, representative or a couple of representatives here today asking us to do this. Uh, and I don't think the governor's answer of because I said so passes constitutional muster uh, in the question of equal branches of government. And uh, that's why I want to support this motion, and uh, I hope you all do too. Mr. Representative, excuse me, Senator Zofsky, if you can this question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I support my good friend. Senator Burns, to serve on the together, um, as I have with quite a few members of this panel. Um, I've worked with the governor and I've fought with the governor, like most people on this panel have one time or another. But I'm supporting this motion. I'm supporting it for very good reasons. I haven't heard the questions I have answered on an open mic. I look to hear and for me to hear to make the judgment. Got to do with this morning. I asked questions that dealt with how, uh, what went on before you made the decision. How did you make the decision? I want to understand more of that. How decisions were made. <clears throat> Who was, if anybody was holding a hammer over anybody else's head or anything like that while they were making decisions. And I think that the, um, the right thing to do, because I was elected to govern, was. Senator or my past life a representative does come up here to represent their people and to govern. And the, the, the only way I know how to come to conclusion is by asking questions and getting answers and making up my mind how people made up their minds to do things. What was um, um, the communications going on that might have or might not have um, um, made those decisions. Was there any any um, conversations? Um, and I was able to ask that today that that brought people to those decisions. I'd like to know what they are. I want to know. Was there any um, weight um, um, pushed on people to make decisions one way or the other? I can only ask those people those questions. I cannot ask our executive director. She was to make those decisions, but those other people were that came in front of today. I got to ask those questions, and I got good answers. And I listened to all the questions that were asked around the world. You all got good answers. I really thank uh, Mr. Moore for being here and doing it voluntarily. These other people have chosen, for whatever their reason, not to come in voluntarily and talk to us. I think it's now up to us if we want to uh, ask them to get to the bottom of anything to really find out, just to ask them to come in in a more formal way. That's what this meeting is. Um, they had a choice of coming in on their own, volunteering with these two. They chose not to, so this is uh, the only recourse I have as a legislator to try and get them to come in and talk on an open mic so that the people in the state of Maine can hear their answers also. So thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator. I guess I'm personally staying very focused on the fact being finding a portion of our mission. Uh, a decision was made about public money. A lot of people who testified today said that constitutes misuse of public money and abuse of, of uh, power. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. We'll come to that decision later on. I'm trying to get to the facts that would lead to that conclusion in the first place. And there are some gray areas that have been 
bandied about, but we haven't discussed that heck of a lot lately. Uh, I have a governor who says, I did it, why wouldn't I? But I also have an acting commissioner who explained that he was acting on the administration's concerns. Much of it appeared to be somewhat in his own discretion, and it's not clear what the nexus was uh, between what the governor was took credit for doing versus what the <laughs> acting commissioner did in his own. That's not really been completely fleshed out for us, so there's a set of facts there that use a little bit of help. And the second is this cabinet meeting where people come out of there with fuzzy, different memories. That's a little disturbing, too. That, to me, could be fleshed out by getting some people in the room to answer some questions. So that's why, if they're not going to come willingly, I, we may have to step up as a legislature and, and carry out people's business. Thank you. Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I agree we really need to get to the bottom of some of the still unresolved inconsistencies to get to the past of this matter. Um, and it's not, as we were reminded by several people speaking today, it's not our job to make a determination uh, on impeachment. It's our job to get to the facts of the matter and let um, the House decide what to do with that. I have questions about um, how the decision to uh, pull back a check payment that was already in process occurred. Um, I have questions about how only one of the multiple entities with which um, there were checks written under that budget line um, was withheld and the others were moved forward in, in spite of there being those payments being in conflict with what was put forward as an explanation why Goodwill Hink Lease was without. Um, and so I think that we need to have people before us that were involved in those matters, in the meeting, the staff meeting that occurred before the DOE staff meeting, and people from the DOE staff meeting, and find out um, how that decision was made, what influenced it, and where that influence or decision came from. Uh, I think that there are other questions as well that we should be getting to the bottom of. Um, I would uh, submit, for instance, that um, regardless of whether uh, communication from the governor is handwritten or not, when the substance of that communication involves exercising a power that exists not in the person, but in the office, that it is an official communication. And I'd like to know exactly what has happened to the copies of that communication that should exist within the office of the government. Uh, so I have multiple questions I'd like to have answers to, and I think it is appropriate that we exercise our power that falls uniquely on this body to compel people to come before us and provide the answers to these important questions raised by the request our investigation, a unanimous vote, pursuant to the request from several legislators regarding their constitutional powers of impeachment. It's our job to get to the bottom of those facts. I understand that uh, the senator disagrees with me on whether the people we're asking to come before us um, are somehow at risk if they expose that. They are, in fact, not named on the lawsuit. Um, and whether that means that they are absolved from any possible jeopardy in the process, of course not. Everyone could come before us and say things that are regarding unfortunate circumstances that expose some liability. That's never stopped us before, nor should it stop us in the future from asking questions that need to be asked to get to the facts of the matter and what we're responsible for investigating. Furthermore, um, the Montgomery um, provided two pages of testimony in effect as to her, her side of her view of what has happened. Um, I submit that if she was particularly concerned about her expressing any information regarding the goodwill weekly matter was going to jeopardize her in some way that perhaps she shouldn't have 
provided her side of the testimony without offering an opportunity for us to ask questions to find out what the, does the answer for us. And it seems to me very inconsistent that um, a legal counsel would consider that this is both a justification for withholding the opportunity to be asked questions, but to provide testimony at the same time. That seems very unbalanced. I therefore would be both feeling that it's proper and it's consistent and it is our responsibility to ask the people that can answer the questions that I mentioned at the beginning of my comment uh, to come before us. And, and I still believe that because they've chosen not to, that it's worthy of a subpoena at this time. But the other people that are cooperative or have not yet been asked and have an opportunity to come before us of their own accord. Um, I think we owe them the uh, respect of asking them nicely and only subpoenaing if, if they refuse to come. Thanks, Senator Representative McCollum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I here thinking that I've gotten two or three notes from the governor in my life. I have no idea where they are. I gotta go find them. So, just like that. I hear they're valuable. Um, I found what Senator Burns said pretty compelling. Um, and, I, and I won't even try to do, say it how he said it, because I'll end up labeling people and calling people names and things. But in, in a sense, his, his comments about bad behavior, boorish behavior, and not, you know, wouldn't do it that way, I, I think. He and I are like-minded in, in uh, as I think about what I understand about this situation, Mr. Chair. Um, it probably is not the way I would have done it either um, if I was in that seat. And I think he makes a good point that he and I aren't in that seat. So um, that's something else to consider. Uh, I find myself sitting here at times today and, and closing my eyes and envisioning other political figures on the trial like this and other people in the room condemning them, whether, you know, for or their activities, um, and that, I guess that's that's what I struggle with. I, I you know, I, I walk around in my communities, and um, people are always saying, "Wow, what Donald Trump just said!" "Wow, what Governor LePage just said!" And I have to say, you know, but what about there's a whole lot of other people that say stuff as well. Um, I go back to Senator Burns, and you know, I think we know a lot about this story. Maybe not everything, but I think we know a lot. And again, while it's boorish and bad and, and out in public, I've said worse things than that about it. I haven't found any, I haven't seen anything critical or um, not critical, but criminal yet. So um, I guess I have a question though. So one of the two people we're talking about is, is the governor's lawyer. There's a lawyer for the governor. The, she is the chief counsel for the governor and the governor's office. The governor has right. hired an independent attorney to represent him in uh, the civil suit. So she's not his attorney in that suit. She's the chief. But here. She's the chief legal counsel. And, and so my question is, not knowing, because I need to be educated on subpoenas, there must be some, um, in her role defending, you know, being his attorney, are there limits, are there things, I mean, how much can our subpoena compel her to speak if she chooses not? And I know it, it looks bad to come here and say no answer, no answer, no answer, but how much can we compel someone who's <coughs> his lawyer to speak? Yeah. Ms. Montgomery declined to come here for certain articulated reasons, none of which had anything to do with the very legitimate question that was offered. So that apparently is not a permanent. Secondly, um, to the extent that there, there may be lines of questioning that we arguably should not be going down, should we decide to move ahead? She's entitled to have counsel here in the circle. So it's, it's difficult to, to predict what is the answer to the question. Right. And, I, and I, I don't know if it's important or not. And, and I, trust me, I'm kind of like, I, I stopped defending. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think it's important to say that this is not simply the case that the governor is not playing with this committee. I mean, I'm on other committees where he just doesn't set people in the summer. And he has, I know he has, I was in Lewiston the other day when he spoke and he explained to the crowd. Here's why I don't send my staff out in the summer. Um, and I just think that's important to say. So. 
not particular to this committee, I don't think. I'm sorry to interrupt, but what you've been discussing reminded me that in some situations before, in the past, when we used this subpoena, it's not necessarily been that people didn't want to come willingly and answer questions. They requested being subpoenaed so that they knew that they had to answer the questions and thereby had a fear of protection from retribution. And um, that occurred in the CDC case. There was a lawsuit come, going on. Um, they just felt that they couldn't come voluntarily. They issued the subpoenas. They all showed up. We had the same discussions. How much can we really expect them to answer? Do we think we can get them to say anything? End of the day is they have the right to say, I'm not going to answer, I don't know. But that didn't occur a lot. I don't know if it will in this situation. But sometimes people want the protection of a subpoena, and that's been our experience in the past. For further discussion, Senator Diamond and then Representative Starkey. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. When I made the motion to uh, issue subpoenas to these two individuals, I, I wouldn't do so lightly. Um, it's a very, very serious issue. Um, this is a very unique committee. And I've been on this committee now, this is my third time. And each time, as we face very uh, delicate, very serious, uh, very sensitive uh, cases, whether it be CDC or the term bite or whatever it may be, this committee is always stalwart in sticking to wanting to get the information. And that's my motivation for this. I think today there's also a fairness issue. And today we saw the public speak and it was 100% on one side of the issue. And I think that it's, in all fairness, there's probably another side that some people who either couldn't be here uh, may want to express. But <coughs> clearly, our whole point as a committee, and always has been, is to find the answers. And we saw what happened today with, with Mr. Moore. His discussion with us, his interaction, caused much greater clarification as to what happened in his particular role. And I'm convinced that having both Mr. Montgomery and Mr. Chairman be here, Chairman be here will also add to our, our goal and our responsibility for this legislature for the public to get to the bottom of this entire affair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Representative Stockier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think that the committee should have been and to hire Marquis because they should have known what would happen. To me, he points out exactly why we need to explore this a little further because what kind of culture is that when decisions of a, a foundation like that is being made because of the fear that somebody's going to do something to you? They should have known better. They knew this. They, you know, I'm, there's a whole lot more to be discovered in my life. Thank you, Representative. Further discussion? Yeah. Senator Burns. Thank you, Senator. I feel compelled to speak again because I'm being referred to a lot. <laughs> I rarely ever take exception to Senator Diamond. What I'm going to do today, sir, first of all, uh, we saw a, a good representation here of one side of the issue. There are, is another side of the issue. In fact, we have a uh, uh, written testimony from Representative Timmons. It's in all of your packages. who says, basically, enough is enough. There are many others I think feel the same way. Uh, obviously, there are, uh, we've been through this for four years. Uh, the other would be like this. Uh, the other thing, I guess, to try to boil this down, I'm not going to know any more after you subpoena these people than I know right now. We know what happened. The governor told us what happened. It, to me, matched up quite well with what Opega told us. And if there's enough information for the legislature to take action based on what we know and what he's admitted, go ahead. If there isn't, then let's move on to something else. But we're not going to learn anything more. I'm not going to learn anything more, I don't believe, other than what I said two minutes ago, some interesting stuff, but not pertinent to uh, anything that would lead to uh, the legislature <coughs> taking action against this government. This is all. To me, a lot of it is kind of pure. If you will. Uh, this is exciting stuff. It's controversial stuff. People want to know more. But we're not going to know any more at the end of the day than what the governor has told us and what O'Kay has told us. If there's enough there, let's do what has to be done. If there isn't, let's move on to something else. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. 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 Thank
Thank you, Senator. Senator Johnson. Mm -hmm. I'd like to address two points briefly. Uh, one is that uh, what we're talking about here is uh, not a question of manners. You know, I don't think there'd be anyone in this room that would uh, stand up and say, I'm, I'm really pleased that the manners you know, and conduct of this office. Um, but malfeasance is another matter. And I think that it is, as we were reminded again today by people who came before us, um, talking about the nature of governance and governing through fear. That this is something that it is our responsibility. And, it, and we owe it to the legislature as the investigative body to get the bottom of the facts regarding this conduct. But second, I think that there is still um, something that we can expect to learn. There are several things that we can expect to learn to for the question. And in particular, it was unclear. There was conflicting testimony uh, in the papers report and no statement regarding it from the governor um, about what happened with uh, holding back the check quarterly payment. And I think that that is another aspect of the scope of what was done in order to threaten the will and it, it behooves us to find out um, whether that was in fact another action initiated and you know, through the office of the governor, through the governor himself, or not. And so I, I would submit that I think there are things to learn in this process and that it is appropriate and it's our responsibility to get those answers. Thank you, Senator. Senator Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've sat and I've kind of listened to everybody's speaking and taken a few notes. And I think Senator Burns is, is, is right in, in one respect, that we know what the governor's actions were. He's admitted what, what his actions were. And going on and, and issuing subpoenas to members of his staff are not going to enlighten us further into what his actions were. We know what they were. The report has stated it and such. Um, in, in gathering more information, again, Senator Burns is correct, it would be interesting, but is it going to really expand the basis of what we have already found out, maybe in little fact? I have a lot of extra questions that I come, have come to mind today. Um, people I would have loved to have heard from today, but is bringing them in and questioning them going to further the cause and the charge of this committee? I would love to have heard from the VP of Finance on what he said to ethics. Perhaps Bill Brown, Glenn Cummings, mm -hmm. the board members and Speaker Eves himself about how did you learn of this position? What was the timing of the position? Mr. Brown, what was your interaction with the other board members? But really, is that going to further what we were actually sent here to do? And I don't think so. I think that's just doing our best to dig up dirt versus actually finding the truth. I think we've already found the truth. We know what happened. I don't want to be a member of this committee to be a dirt digging committee. I don't want to do that. Um, I, I think this is this whole issue is accumulation of a very sad but unfortunate series of events. But again, like Senator, like Representative McClellan and Senator Burns, I don't see where a law has actually been broken. I won't be supporting the motion to subpoena the governor's staff. I don't think they as individuals will have any more information than we already have to 
further the charge and move this committee forward. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, vote in favor of the motion for two reasons. First of all, I think it is important that we separate fact from fiction. Right now, that line is, at least in my mind, somewhat blurred. I agree with what Representative Sanderson just said, that we don't know whether the testimony of Ms. Montgomery and Mr. Chadbourne will add anything. But the reason we don't know is because they haven't come. They, they did not agree to be interviewed by the Pega staff. They did not accept an invitation to appear here today. These are two people who were right smack dab in the middle of this whole incident and communicating with people from Google Inc. and others. We don't know where they're going to sit because they won't tell us where they're going to sit. And the reasons for not appearing today I, I find not to be acceptable as far as this committee is concerned. They're essentially saying that, look, there's a, a lawsuit going on and it would be inappropriate for us to come and testify with a pending lawsuit. That's the same line of reason you heard in the CDC case with the document trail. This committee rejected that line of, of argument again, and we were right to do so. Because those people came, they came under subpoena, we had, we had an opportunity to question them, we did learn a lot from them. And guess what, the lawsuit went on, life went on, and the case ended up being settled. So the, the reason it's being given, in, in, in that case, we had named defendants who were subpoenaed to be in this case, uh, these folks are not going to come. So I think separating fact from fiction is what we are supposed to be doing, and that argues to me in favor of issuing a subpoena. The second reason is because we have the public hearing today, I think for a reason. That's we wanted to hear from the public. And I don't think there's much question that we heard from the public. That, that, that is that they are not satisfied um, with uh, where things stand and the fact that certain individuals are refused to come and share with us the knowledge they have of these events. And I think to honor the, the clear message, and it could not have been more clear, the clear message from the public today, that militates in favor of issuing the subpoena. And the third reason is a little bit outside the specific facts of this panel, but it has to do with our role as a legislature. We didn't ask to be here to be doing this. We are stuck with this, this responsibility. And we are basically being told by a, a separate branch of government that they are not going to cooperate with our legitimate work. Now we can accept that and move on with life. But we can say, no, that's not acceptable. We are the legislature. Uh, we are, we're doing important work here that we voted by 12 to nothing to do. And we're going to stand up for the integrity of this institution. And that's what I intend to do with my vote. I can tell you that it's painful to do. Senator Burns is my seatmate not only in this committee but in the Senate. We don't, don't always agree politically, but when it comes to matters of judgment, I have no more respect for anyone than I do for Senator Burns. This is one time I'm going to differ, and I, I will vote in favor of the motion. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the pending motion? We are going to uh, issue those subpoenas to those two individuals. There are other decisions we're going to have to make as we move along here, but I query whether we need to make any more today. Um, only if there are other individuals you wanted to invite and possibly subpoena if they weren't going to be here. Um, it, there are people who would be relevant to the matter, for example, that Senator Johnson delineated we wanted to know more about that we did have uh, recollections of um, that people that were in that room for those conversations that um, Ms. Montgomery and Mr. Chad weren't, weren't present for. So I guess that would be the only other thing to process. Give it a, a, a Thank you. Representative Campbell and Sharon Kruger. Thank you. 
I think if they would request it, then it, it's not time for subpoena. I think if we have an interest in someone showing them, ask them. Yes, and I think that's what we had talked about before, typically. But in order to not hold up the process, sometimes what this committee does is say, we want to invite them. We ask them to respond by a particular day, whether or not they're willing to come. If not, the committee has pre-voted already to um, issue subpoenas, if that should be the case, if we really, so that you don't have to go another meeting and then have that discussion. Um, again. Chairman Kruger. Yes, I'm curious to clarify uh, uh, the Acting Commissioner of Education. Uh, we, we have invited him. He has told the chair that he wants to come, but has, is it, I mean, I, w I want him here. <laughs> really need to hear. So I, I'd like to I, it would clarify that, I guess, is where we are, because if he declines our invitation, then we have to wait till our next meeting to be to him, and I'd love to see him. And, I know he wants to speak to us, but I'd like to get I'd like to get that kind of confirmed. Um, I think he would be in the same <coughs> boat as the ones I just described, okay. issuing an invitation to come uh, to the next meeting. He somehow says he refuses to, other than not being able to refuse to. If he voted to do so, he would issue a Senator Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would, uh, we heard today that uh, Bill Brown was, he was on the board, he was he accused himself and he did appear as a, as a guest, or at least as an observer at one point. I would, I would like to see that him come as well. Is that the pleasure? Well, that's why I don't think we take a vote on each person, but is that the pleasure of the group to invite Mr. Brown? Yeah. Okay. So we are now at the point where we have um, I, my understanding is that he was, uh, he spoke in an interview with you and maybe another member of the staff, and that he has answered all your questions. Is there anything you would need to know, Ben, from, from Bill? Uh, I, again, I think it's important to, in context, decide what it is that you're trying to get for additional facts. We have inconsistent stories about things to do with the reason the check was withheld. We've said in our report it's unclear whether the governor gave any directive to do that, inviting a certain set of people to help answer that question. I can't think of any questions that we still have around um, what Mr. Brown's involvement might have been, other than some of you, I think, have this um, pending question about whether he somehow influenced the process to the point that that the speaker was hired when he shouldn't have. And I just can tell you from the documents that we looked at, that Goodwill Hinkley's selection process, that I just don't have any, I saw no evidence of that in any way, shape, or form. I saw a very well-documented, thorough, structured process that had involvement of a lot of people at many different levels of Goodwill Hinkley. So if that is something you feel you need to know to decide whether this is an abuse that stepped over the line, then certainly invite him. But um, it's not an area where I have, we have any great, um, great understanding. All right, we're going to take these people one at a time. So Mr. Brown's name is coming before us. Senator Diamond wishes to have him. I think that we we'll probably go through these one at a time. Can I just explain why? Sure. Um, the reason is because he's part of the speaker's staff, and I think um, I think it's, it's fair that we get a chance to ask other committee members get a chance to ask questions for the same reason we want to ask questions of other people. So it just seems like a, a, an obvious invitation. That's the motion. Is there a second? Second. Uh, further discussion with respect to that motion. Thank you, Senator. Real quick. Um, to some extent, there are some people who, whose motives have been questioned uh, as we investigate this, uh, whether uh, Mr. Brown has improperly influenced anything. It would be probably handy from his point of view to come and say, no, it didn't happen. Uh, so to some extent, some people may need a little help in clearing their own names uh, as we go forward with this. So I certainly don't oppose having him come in and giving us a good explanation, even if it reveals nothing further. 
Further discussion with respect to the motion? Senator Johnson. Uh, I find that an interesting suggestion. I mull that over. Uh, but I, I think that the question of uh, the board arriving at a decision on who to hire is not what we're investigating. We're investigating the process by which funding to the school uh, was altered and influenced the decision which is, as we heard um, earlier today, the sole discretion of the board to make. So I, I certainly, I mean, although someone might want to come here and clear their name, I, I think it's not relevant to facts in the investigation we've been asked to pursue. Further discussion? The focus here is not on whether the speaker was or was not qualified to be the president and what were his relative merits compared to other people who might be candidates or, or any of that. Um, make an interesting inquiry in and of itself, but none of our business, right? As far as I see it. So, further discussion, Representative Campbell and Representative Sanderson. You know, I think, with all due respect, I, I, I believe that it may have something to do with. With it, uh, in terms of the, the, the original uh, job description evolution, um, and I'd just like to hear from you. Representative Sanderson. Thank you. I respectfully disagree with you, Senator, on, on that. Um, as I stated earlier, um, obviously, the Gulf Center has been a Downward supporter and champion of this school since we voted on that in the 125th. And <coughs> his obvious distress, his actions are a complete, are, are what are under question, yes, but his obvious distress over the hiring of someone who, via public record, um, was vigorously opposed to this school, it was the catalyst for this entire event. I think it's quite relevant to understand the series of events which led up to the hiring of Speaker Eves. In that regard, I think it's very important to have Mr. Brown here. So he can maybe clarify for us the timeline of when Mr. Cummings told him about the job, told him to let Speaker Eves know. I think it's I think it's appropriate on the question just to invite somebody here. Discussion. I am going to change my vote. <laughs> <laughs> because I realized that my colleague Senator Burns who will be the meeting to be voting to have Mr. Brown come. I know that Senator Davis, who has a family emergency, is very strongly about having Mr. Brown come. I have to channel my colleague to my vote. Any further discussion? All those in favor of Senator Diamond's motion? One, two, three, four, five, six. All those opposed? One, two, three. Did that right? Not to comment. Could I clarify whether the motion was A, just to invite Mr. Brown to come voluntarily, or B, if he's not willing to come to support? The motion is simply to invite. Okay. Thank you for that clarification, Senator. All right. Is there anyone else that we would like to either invite or invite the prospect that the people is inclined with this? Representative Sanderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would actually like to invite the gentleman who was the VP for Finance, who indicated in um, the ethics report that Pinkley's finances would continue to be stable with or without the state funding, yet we're hearing very clear um, indication from um, Mr. Moore today that that was not. And that obviously had a lot to do, I'm not sure if that had anything to do with the board hiring or final hiring or not, but I think, I think that 
with that in that report, it has a, I think we need to ask somebody about that. Yeah. I might, um, certainly we can invite him. I, I just want to let you know that if you think, you think about subpoenaing him, I don't, he's no longer with Goodwill Hinckley. He was there on an interim basis. My understanding is he goes to Florida um, at some point in fall or the winter. So I just would want to be, know what you wanted to do if we invite him and he's not physically able to come from another location. I don't know for sure that he's there or not, but I know maybe that he comes Would it be appropriate to, to maybe have Beth and her staff, that truck and her staff reach out to him if he is not? in the area and indeed are you gone to Florida perhaps some written document would that be appropriate about why he would have indicated to ethics when they queried um, when speaker Eves posed their question to them well I think he, he already covered that ground he did okay to cover that ground with him quite a bit so I don't know if there's a question you have that I might already um, have his answer to. Um, I guess my, my absolute question is, why did you tell Apex <coughs> that Hankley would be stable without the state funding? Yet clearly that was a, not not the case. Um, the steps that Mr. Jerdak took when he got uh, that inquiry, which by the way he fielded because the interim president was not available. Um, he talked with the director of admissions at the Neen School, and it seemed like the whole focus on, was on trying to determine what impact that funding would have on the student population within that span of time of the biennium. He understood from the director of admissions that the percentage of students that were currently on campus who were um, part of means and whatnot, that there would not be a big impact on the number of students that would still be attending the school by virtue of the residential program not being forthcoming. Mr. Jurak did not indicate in his comments to us that he had given any further thought beyond that to how that would perhaps impact the overall plan to advance uh, enrollment to 210 students which is the area where the Harold Alphon Foundation and um, Chairman Moore that you heard from today, that's where they had their real serious concerns that it was going to stop the momentum of the school in being able to attract those students. So my observation from listening to both points is that they were coming at it from a little bit different perspective. Uh, Mr. Jurdak's perspective was more, is this an immediate, is this going to be an immediate concern for the school? He felt he had ideas about how they would get by without the 530000 But the impact on the Alphon grant and everything else was not part of what he was considering at that time. Okay. All right, so is that? I'll withdraw my reply. Okay, thank you. Uh, any uh, other people that you would like to discuss have come? Uh, Representative Sprocket. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I just have a couple of people on here. Rich Abramson. Sarah Vanderwood and Jay Nutting. Jay Nutting, a uh, Google board member, a uh, lobbyist, and then the Hingley lobbyist seemed to be Sarah Vanderwood was kind of in the middle of a lot of stuff. And Rich Abramson specifically because today that's who um, Mr. Moore said he heard the first time that there was an expert. So I guess he, I would be trying to like to know where that chain was. So those are understand that and obviously uh, Christian is driving some of this. <coughs> All right, so you suggest three people for yep. invitations or invitations with subpoenas to call. Here's my thoughts on that. I think we should invite them, but I also think that I'm concerned about the fact that some people may still fear retribution or retaliation. So I guess if, if, if they can't feel that they can come and they say they're not coming, then I guess we subpoena them because I want them to come. And I'll do whatever I can to protect them because I think that there's legitimate reasons that they can go in there. So why don't we take one at a time? There's a, there's a motion to invite and then subpoena and the absence of the subpoena. Richard, can you take that one first? Is there a second? I'm hearing a second. Second by Senator Johnson. Any discussion with respect to that motion? Representative Sanderson. 
I'd be happy to um, happy to vote in favor of any indications, but I, I'm not going to vote to vote for any. to direct me to 
inquiry the reason for not wanting to attend? <laughs> Motion currently on the board is to just invite this board. And there's been a motion in the Senate. We're going to be in the same Sprocket. position with the Commissioner to start if we so want to. So, so what were you suggesting just now? Uh, I was just uh, talking about whether to ferret out whether they thought they needed protection or not. <laughs> um, that would get kind of comments. Well, I'll, I think that. Forrester, is there a motion with respect to her? <coughs> See none. With respect to Ms. Palmer, is there a motion with respect to her? See none. Is there anybody else that you maybe would like to? <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just trying to make sure you think this all through so that we're not in this situation again. The other unclear place in our information brief was whether the governor personally communicated to anyone at Goodwill Hinckley or the Harold Alphonse specifically that funding would be cut. The two people who took calls directly from the governor were Rich Abramson and Greg Powell of the Harold Alphonse Foundation. So I don't know if you want to discuss um, our hands. We have not dealt with the emotion of the state. You have voted to invite him. Yeah, so you're about your, you voted to invite him. Anybody else uh, have any suggestions to make? Right? Yeah. Seeing none, 
What else do we have to do today with respect to this week's session? Is there, a motion? <laughs> Is there a motion to recess the work session? Because we're going to continue with this one. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, move second. 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 All in favor? It's unanimous. So the work session, with respect to this review, is concluded. Or is recessed.